This is looking at the effects of physical agents on bacteria. It's covering exercises 24 through 27. So we're just going to kind of combine them together. The physical agents, we're looking at different things that are going to help control the growth of microorganisms. Now, they may just be inhibiting the growth and not killing them, or they may be completely destroying them and killing them either way. Some examples of these are using pressurized steam, such as an autoclave that's used to sterilize a lot of uh, different things in labs, from equipment to media, etc. Moist heat is another example. And when you're boiling water, that boiling is going to denature proteins. If you denature the proteins, structure determines function, so therefore, the cell can no longer function properly, so that's going to kill the microorganisms. Something you have to be careful about are spores. Some organisms contain endospores that will greatly increase the survival rate of microorganisms when you put them or expose them to different physical agents. Ultraviolet light is another example of a physical agent. It tends to destroy or damage the DNA. And then something else is changing the osmotic pressure. When you alter the osmotic pressure of the solution that an organism is in, that can also inhibit or kill the microorganism. So we're going to briefly look at these. Moist heat in this experiment, what you do is you use four different temperatures, room temperature, 40, 80, and 100 degrees C. Remember, 100 degrees C is boiling. So the room temperature is used as a control. You want to make sure that your culture was viable, that it was living to begin with. So you can see what the, the normal growth pattern is like. So you will start with that. You streak it on a plate. Then you take that same tube. It's in a, a broth culture. You use that same tube now, put it into a 40 degree water bath for 10 minutes. Why using the same tube? Because you just tested it at room temperature to know that it was living. If you used a different tube, you're kind of adding another variable there. So you want to use the exact same culture. After 10 minutes, you're going to streak it on a different plate. You're going to. Then take that same tube now, put it into the 80 degrees C for 10 minutes, streak on a plate, and then 100 degrees C and streak it on a plate. You're gradually increasing the temperature, and you have to go in this order so that then after incubating the plates for 24 hours, you can see whether growth occurred or not. So whether uh, culture is able to survive at different temperatures and trying to figure some organisms may die at 60 degrees, some may die at 100 degrees. Uh, some of that's going to be dependent on if they can produce a spore. The vegetative cells are pretty much all going to die, certainly at 100 degrees C or even lower. The, but the spores, it's a survival mechanism that some, not all, but some microorganisms have where it allows them to survive in an adverse environmental condition. That temperature starts heating up. It's going to kill the vegetative cell, but there's enough time where the organism is able to produce spores. And then when favorable conditions return, those spores germinate back into a vegetative cell, and you didn't kill out the species. <coughs> So by doing tests like this, it can help you to figure out what's the minimum temperature that is required to inhibit the growth of a specific organism. If you're trying to inhibit growth, why heat it to 100 degrees C if 60 degrees is going to be sufficient? So that's one example of physical agent. Another example is ultraviolet light or UV light. It does disrupt that DNA-based sequence. And therefore, it's going to prevent DNA replication from occurring properly because you've basically you've messed up the sequence of the DNA. So what we do here is we take the samples, we plate them out on petri dishes, and then we expose the plates to UV light for different amounts of time. So you're going to have a zero time, that's your control, and then you're going to vary the amounts of time that you expose to the UV light and then incubate the plates and see if, if growth was inhibited or not. 
Now, something to keep in mind when you do an experiment like this is that UV cannot, light cannot penetrate through plastic. It also has problems penetrating through glass. So you will need to remove the lid of the Petri dish when you go to do this experiment. UV light is often used um, to decontaminate a room. It's very good at decontaminating on surfaces or in the air. So oftentimes labs will have a UV light that you turn on at the end of the day when no one's in there. Um, you don't want to expose yourself to long periods of UV light because just as if you're outside in the sunlight, it can also damage your DNA. So you need to be cautious of that. Drying or desiccation or dehydration is removing water from substances. Water is essential for all forms of life. And so if you remove water, that's going to inhibit the growth of microorganisms. And so dehydration, that removement, removing of the water can be very effective. This is used a lot in food preservation. Um, you dry out the food, you desiccate it, you dehydrate it. One thing you have to keep in mind are those spores again. They can resist dehydration, and so that's something you have to be aware of. And like I say in food microbiology, um, dehydration is used a lot, but then there are certain mechanisms you have to keep in mind for the spores. Osmotic pressure, this is another form of physical agents that can help to control microbial growth. And usually what we're talking about here is altering the salt concentration of the solution that you're growing the microorganism in. So for this test, you have nutrient broth with varying concentrations or amount of salt. If a microorganism cannot tolerate a high salt concentration, it's usually because there's the, a difference in the osmotic pressure. It cannot handle that. And it ends up killing the cell. Um, now, once again, this has been used in terms of food microbiology and preserving food, increasing the salt that often acts as um, a way of preserving food and preventing the microbial growth from occurring because most organisms cannot tolerate that high salt. There are a few that can, but most cannot. And then cold temperature is uh, another method. Most organisms are inhibited by cold temperatures. And the reason for that is because cold temperature tends to slow down most chemical reactions. So if it's slowing down the metabolic reactions, it's slowing down the metabolic rate. And therefore, the organisms, uh, it inhibits the growth of them. Now, this usually doesn't kill it, it's just inhibiting, and that's where we make that distinction in the terms. It may be, say if you're talking about bacteria, it may be bacterial static, meaning it's inhibiting. It is not bacterial cidal, meaning it does not kill it. So when you, say you have a food item, when you take that item and you have had it in, say, the refrigerator, and then you put it at room temperature, you didn't kill the organism. So if you leave it at room temperature for a long period of time, you're going to see increased growth. That's why we use the phrase, keep your cold foods cold to prevent that contamination.